Hi, this is George Alger, and welcome to today's segment of Arventura TV. Today's guest expert is John Biggs, who is a local composer. Welcome, John. Thank you for having me on the program. It's great to have you. So I know you compose a lot of different things. Could you highlight what, you, what your work embraces? Yes, there's a lot of choral music in my catalog. I've written for chamber ensembles, uh, small ensembles. I've written for symphony orchestra. Uh, I've written some music that's danced to, ballet, written a couple of operas, um, and that's about it. I mean, it's uh, most of the genre, genres of, uh, of classical music that I've touched on, really. Good. Now, could you define <coughs> what composing is? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I can't I, tell you either. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I suppose I, I, I don't think I've ever been asked that question, but... Um, for the general public, uh, the, the process is having a mind that thinks in, in music. Uh, ever since I was a child, if I, if I heard various sounds in the streets, I would always relate them to music, to so what they look like on the, on the page. Uh, a, a, cor a car horn or an animal sound, whatever. They always suggest um, rhythm, melody, uh, and it's, it's just a way of thinking. And then when you come to composing, it's a matter of dealing with the nitty gritty of getting those ideas that you have and writing them down on paper. And that's, it, facing a blank music page is the biggest challenge. But if you have an imagination and you already have ideas, uh, they just, when you're lucky, they just flow out. So let me ask you this, would you equate composing to writing? Very much so, yeah. Okay. The writer has, uh, usually has a whole idea of what the story is. Some, some writers uh, know how it ends when they start the piece. Some writers write the end first. Uh, the, that happens in composition too. Um, usually I know where I'm going and I know where I want to be in a certain time. It may be a piece that's five minutes long or 30 minutes long. Uh, but for me, and it's like architecture, uh, I have to plan things out. I have to know where I'm going. What will I, where will I be in three minutes from now? Where do I want to be? Do I want to be fast by then? Do I want to be slow? And form comes into it too. Just as writers, you know, it, and, and writers of poetry, they follow form, and uh, form is an important aspect of both composition and uh, li the literary branches, really. Good. Now, are all composers musicians first who became composers, or is there no correlation? I don't know if I can answer that. I think generally uh, composers do play some instrument, uh, and often it's piano, um, because, uh, in fact, in the 19th century, that's, we hear so much art song with piano accompaniment, and, and chamber music with piano accompaniment, say, say there are five of their instruments and piano. In the 19th century, the composers were almost always the pianist, so you find piano parts that are overbearing on the other instruments because the composer was there. You know, he wanted to write a good part for himself. So, um, yeah. Now, speak a little bit about how your path brought you to being a composer. Well, I was one of 11 children, um, number eight of 11 children. And my father was an organist, not E. Power Biggs, but Richard Keyes Biggs. And music was in my family from the day I, I was born, really, and all of us, uh, because of our parents. My mother was a soprano, and my father was an organist, and they were actually started in Brooklyn, and then he got a job at Montreal Cathedral as the uh, director of music there. And uh, she sang uh, solos and, and with the choir. He couldn't stand the cold, and uh, he once went to a factory that was a Cassavant organ factory, which is located in Montreal. It was a Saturday afternoon, and he, uh, they were building a new organ. And he said, where is this organ going? And they said, Hollywood, California. So he had quite a name at that time, and knowing that he wanted to get out of Canada in the cold, and he thought of California, and he, he uh, telegrammed them. And he identified himself. They knew his name. They wrote him back and said, how soon can you come? Wow. 
So he came to Hollywood in 1928 with five kids. And then the crash came in 1929, and then they had six more kids. <laughs> so uh, it, it's quite a colorful background. And, and the, to answer your question, music was a part of our lives from the time we were kids with that family. Okay, and did you start out knowing you were interested in composing, or did you start out playing piano? Well, my mother, I don't know how she did it with 11 kids, but she got a piano lessons for us, which she got violin lessons for me and my sister. Uh, somehow she really, she was French and raised uh, in a very cultural family and loved the arts and it just brushed off on all of us. Um, so we were lucky to have her, you know, it really helped. So you, so what instruments do you play? I could list a lot of them. Uh, if I, in fact, I will name them because the audience will be curious about what they are and why those instruments. Let me explain. Um, piano was, was a basic thing, but also when you p can play piano, you can play also a harpsichord mm. or a clavichord, which are period instruments from the Renaissance and uh, around 1500, 1600 that time. Those were the keyboard instruments. So I played those, and then I played a portative organ, and it was a small organ, about that wide, so it didn't have a full keyboard, and you pumped the, the bellows, and there was, a, there was a bellows in the back that supplied the air. And you had to be coordinated enough to be able to play in a certain rhythm and keep your, your rhythm here and the pump separate from that. And I had to train my singers to do that. They wanted to, if they were doing it in uh, dom, bom, bom, the music was going like, they'd want to go like this with the, but you can't do that. Anyway, the portative organ was challenging to play. Then I played crumhorn, which is a uh, double reed instrument, um, and it's like an oboe, but it has a krum in it. The Germans call that crooked body a krum. So it was a krum horn, and uh, there was a family of them. In fact, I have to share this with you. One night, one day, we were getting on the plane and walking down the ramp, and I had this suspicious looking long black case, and the gal at the entrance way, she caught me on the ramp. Sir, what, what is in that black case? And I said, a family of crumhorns. And she said, all right, go ahead. She didn't, she didn't know what to say. I mean, she, who could make up an answer like that? So crumhorns, recorders, they also come in families, and they're the predecessor of the flute, which is played this way. Recorders played this way, made out of wood. Um, played the viola da gamba, which is the predecessor of the cello, uh, which sits in your lap. And uh, actually, it sits your, on your legs, the gambas. She has nice gams. You huh. That comes from the Italian. Really? So yeah, you play it this way. And um, so viola da gamba. What else did I play? Rauschfife, which is a, just exactly what it, the Germans call it. It's a raucous pipe. <clears throat> and that's a double reed instrument too, but it, <clears throat> it's like almost as loud as a trumpet. Um, what else? Oh, Mistral's harp. I had a little harp that I played. In fact, uh, we made a film called Discovering the Music of the Middle Ages, and uh, I played harp in that and sang a solo, and all these instruments were featured in it. And it's one of the best. It, it won the Encyclopedia Britannica's uh, award for best educational film of 1968. It goes back that far. Wow. Sorry. 1986. Okay. So you not only play a lot of interesting instruments, you're also a vocalist, you just mentioned as yes. well. Yes. Okay. So you really do cover the gamut of music. I'm wondering if you could, if you're looking back over your career, if there's some guidance you might offer to, you know, younger people who are looking at composing. When I was in my early teens, um, I would spend a lot of time, uh, when everybody else went to bed, I'd get up late and uh, put it on low, put on the classical music station and listen to the music. And uh, I just, it was kind of an aphrodisiac for me. Uh, and I learned what composers I liked, what composers I hated, what composers I could tolerate. Uh, but I, I got favorite composers from that and I would, I don't know, if you, if you have a classical music station, classical music is in the background in our culture. You, you could name the, the names of the pop singers, but name, give me names of 
three American composers of classical music, I don't know. Younger people might not be able to do that. They would know Aaron Copland, you know, and Samuel Barber maybe, and, uh, and Bernstein, Leonard Bernstein. But other than that, they wouldn't have much of an idea of who's composing what now. But, so let me interrupt you there because you bring up an interesting point. Because composing embraces more music than classical, but you seem to be referring to composing as specifically pertinent to uh, classical. Is, is that your framework? That is absolutely my framework. Um, however, uh, with my present partner, uh, I've, she, she writes and sings um, in uh, a kind of pop area and country area. And uh, I must admit, I've, I w I'm ignorant of that whole literature. And Robbie will come up with, they'll, they'll be playing a, a piece on the radio. I have no idea of what it is. And she starts singing along with it. And I say, oh, you know this piece? Well, yeah, don't you know it? You know, so it's a, it's a whole, um, not a, it's a different world. But you can find value in, there's, there are wonderful pieces written in all of those fields. And you can pick and choose. You could do the same thing with the radio, you know, find out what popular artists you like and identify with them. Just for me, being raised in a Catholic church, you know, Catholic, and being raised on Gregorian chant mm -hmm. and uh, polyphonic masses, uh, I wasn't raised in the general sense of an American. And most of them, most of young people were raised uh, Protestant or in the Jewish faith. But and when you're raised Catholic in that time, in the 30s, 40s, uh, you're involved with uh, a different genre of music, that's for sure. Okay, so we're running out of time here, but just to um, recap in terms of guidance, it seems like you're, you're suggesting that for someone who's interested in composing for classical music, certainly they should listen to a lot of classical music, and um, I guess, would it be correct to say you're also suggesting find out what you like and what you don't like? Yeah. Okay. Give it a chance. Okay. <laughs> All right, and then, but so, okay, great. So now a person understands they like this kind of music more. Really, composing is still a um, highly imaginative activity. Is there anything else you might suggest? You have to have an imagination. Yeah. Just you, you likened it to writers, you know. You have to have an imagination and you, uh, you know, a lot of creative ideas come when I'm just waking up in the morning or when I'm just going to sleep. The, the mind is going through a certain kind of transition there where the imagination comes to the foreground. And you let that play. Sometimes I've gotten up out of bed to write down a melody that comes to me. So you may be gifted with having spontaneous melodies, and spontaneous music ideas, and that, that makes you a composer. Sounds like a good thing. Yeah. So we're just about out of time here. I'm wondering if you might have a summating message you'd like to convey to the viewers. I would like them to be more aware of classical music um, in our culture. Seek it out on the radio. KUSC is a good station from LA, uh, and they, they play classical music all day, actually. But just become aware of it, and that would, that would be what I would uh, urge them to do. Because you can get popular music all the time. It's on all the stations. You just have to pick and choose, find out where you can get that classical music. And who knows, you may become addicted. You know? <laughs> cool, thank you very much, John. You're welcome. This is George Alger signing off for this segment of Arventura TV. Until we meet again.